All right, we're at lesson 15, and our title of our chapter today is Things with Wings, 1934. When we got down off the train, Grandma was there on the platform. After our first visit, she'd never met us at the train, figuring we could find our own way. But here she was, under the webby old black umbrella to shade her from the sun. But she wasn't there to meet us. She was seeing somebody off. A lady was climbing up into the car behind ours. We caught only a squint in the dazzling light, but knew the hat. It was Missy, Mrs. Effie Wilcox. With a powerful arm, Grandma swung Mrs. Wilcox's bulging valise aboard like her suitcase. Then a picnic camper. She stepped back as the bluebird pulled out. She didn't wave, but scanned the windows to see if Mrs. Wilcox found a seat. Then Grandma turned to us. You could never call her a welcoming woman, but today her mind was truly miles away. I was falling behind with our suitcase, though this year I was nearly as tall as Grandma herself. Was Mrs. Wilcox going on a trip? Mary Alice inquired. She's gone for good, Grandma said, off to double up with her sister at Palmyra. Banks were closing on her house, so she lit out, means she left, not wanting to watch them dump her stuff in the road. After Wilcox died, she left the farm and bought that house in town, but she can't keep up with the payments. At noon dinner the day that day, Mary Alice and I distracted Grandma with all of the excitement we'd left behind in Chicago. In July, they'd killed John Dillinger, public enemy number one. He'd been on a long spree, robbing banks throughout the Middle West. The public didn't know whether they wanted him caught or not. He provided a lot of entertainment and hard times. Since he stole from banks, he was called a Robin Hood, though he wasn't known for giving to the poor. He'd gone to a picture show at the Biography Theater not far from our neighborhood. With him were two bad women, and one of them tipped off the cops who filled him full of lead on the sidewalk. Then, to prove they'd finally nailed John Dillinger, the police put his body on display in the morgue basement. People trooped past for a look. Women dipped their handkerchiefs in his bloody wounds for souvenirs. But he was so bloated and shot up that some people said it wasn't Dillinger at all. Rumor had it that he was holed up somewhere. Mary Alice and I had sulked because neither mother nor dad would take us to view the riddled corpse. Recalling to ourselves shotgun Cheatham, we thought we could take it. When we got back to school in September, everybody would say they'd seen the cadaver. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity lost. I'd have took you, Grandma said. We didn't doubt it. Grandma wouldn't have minded a look for herself at all that remained of John Dillinger. Mary Alice and I went upstairs to sort out her clothes from the single suitcase. She was getting particular about how everything she wore had to be hung up on a hanger, just so. Grandma's missing Miss Wilcox, she mentioned. Are you kidding, I said. She's Grandma's worst enemy. She says Mrs. Wilcox's tongue is attached in the middle and flaps at both ends. The town will be quieter without her and Grandma will like that. You don't know anything, Mary Alice said. Men don't have any idea about women. So I loped uptown by myself, heading for Veach's Gas and Oil, which was man's country. Ray Veach ran the garage when his dad was farming, and I thought I had some business with him. The town was half asleep with August and the Depression. A checker game was going on in the coffee pot cafe as I went past, but nothing else. A knot of people outside Moore's store waited for the day-old bread to go half price. In the window of Stubbs and Askew, the assur insurance agency, you could put up handbills. The biggest was a drawing of a giant farm implement shed that Deer and Company was proposing to put up on the block where the old brickyard had been. Next to it, a handbill advertising a rummage sale at the United Brethren Church. Bring in by Treasures Trash Bric-a-Brac, Down to Earth Prices, Lunch Provided by Our Ladies Circle. The last handbill was a schedule of the movies the Lions Club was showing at their outdoor picture show. They weren't new movies. Some of them weren't even talkies. It looked like a slow week. I crossed the Wabash tracks past the grain elevator on my way to Beach's garage, eating the dust off the trucks hauling in the beans. Beach's garage had been the blacksmith shop, and they still kept the anvil inside. Now it was a one-pump filling station with an outdoor lift. I blundered along toward it. Then the dust cleared, and I saw her. It was love at first sight, like I'd been waiting for her all my life. She stood on the pavement in front of Beaches, shimmering in her loveliness, and so graceful she might glide past me if I wasn't there, leaving me in the dust. She was a showroom fresh Terraplane 8 from the Hudson Motor Car Company, a four-door sedan, tan with red striping, and another touch of red on the hubcaps. 
tears spraying from my eyes. Um, I couldn't help it. My hands curled like I had a steering wheel in my grip. No car company had an agency in Grandma's town, not even Ford. <clears throat> but Peaches would order you a car. Wright said nobody had bought one in two years. He ducked out from under an ancient locom locomobile up on the lift, working a greasy rag over his big hands. Ray was 17 and man size, and I'd worked hard to know him because I wanted him to teach me how to drive. He'd given me a couple of lessons last summer, but he wanted $2 for the full course. People around here didn't overreact when, even when they hadn't seen you for a year. Ray jerked a thumb back at the locomobile he'd been working under. Threw a rod, I nodded like I knew, but I couldn't take my eyes off the terraplane. Did somebody order it? Ray rubbed his stubbled chin with the back of his hand in a way that I admired. Who's got $795? This baby's top of the line, son. It's got a radio. I wanted to ask him if he'd driven it, but that was too close to asking him for a ride and a lesson. We both knew I didn't have $2. Hudson's sending out their new terraplane models to drum up interest. It's the make Dillinger drove to outrun the cops. But hey, you'd know about that, Ray said. You probably took a gander at the body the Chicago cops put on display. You reckon it was really Dillinger? I shrugged. I could see this was the summer when I missed out on everything. That night after supper, Grandma said, I suppose you kids want to go to the picture show, meaning she wanted to go to the picture show. We were willing, though going to the picture for us was the Oriental Th Theater in Chicago, featuring a first-run movie, a pipe organ, and a stage show with a dog act. It was different at Grandma's. On Wednesday nights, the Lions Club sponsored the picture show in the park. They put up canvas walls so it was like a tent without a roof. You sat on benches and they showed the movie on a sheet hung from the branch of a tree. Everybody but Baptists came. Admission was a nickel ahead or a can of food for the hungry. Grandma took a quarter mason jar of her beets and we three got in on that. Since nobody liked sitting behind Grandma, we settled in the back row. There was some socializing she didn't take part in. Then the projectionist got the film threaded and the show started. Mary Alice had been hoping for a Shirley Temple, but it was a Dracula, not too old, starring... Bella Lugosi. I have to say, it got to me. All those living dead people with black lips. When Dracula turned into a bat at the window, the night behind him merged with the night around us. It was a good audience for a horror picture. Several people screamed, and once a whole bench turned over. A night breeze sighed in the tree, making the screen waver. Mary Alice kept her eyes shut through most of it. Grandma barely blinked. Afterward, we walked home in the dark, Mary Alice stuck close to Grandma, and I wasn't far off myself. The town was just one shadow after another. When a big lilac bush threw leaf patterns on the walk ahead of us, Grandma shied like a horse, so she was a little scared. Then we came to an old oak tree growing close to the road. Grandma pulled back and edged around it like Count Dracula was standing on the other side in a cape. Two or three years earlier, we'd have thought the movie had spooked Grandma. Now we wondered if she was trying to spook us. When we were safely inside at home, she made a business of latching the screen door. Then she looked meaningfully at the window over by the sink, like Dracula's electric eyes might be staring in, out of his terrible fanged face. Mary Alice and I were frozen to the linoleum in spite of ourselves. Grandma, there aren't such things as vampires, are there? Mary Alice asked. Did she want to know, or was she testing Grandma? Every summer, Mary Alice seemed to pick up another of Grandma's traits. Vampires? No. The only bloodsuckers is the banks. Grandma stroked her chins. Movies is all pretend. They're made in California, you know, but they prove a point. Make something seem real and people will believe it. The public will swallow anything. That seemed her last word for the night. Now Mary Alice and I had to stumble up the long staircase to the darkness above. Being the man of the family, I ought to have gone first, but I didn't. Sweet dreams, Grandma said behind us. It was a long night and hot. Mary Alice shut her window to keep vampire bats out. I know because I heard her closing hers when I was closing mine. The next morning, after that restless night, I said to Grandma at the breakfast table, I need two bucks bad. Who don't, Grandma said. What for? Driving lessons. And Ray Veach wants two dollars to teach me. What do you want to learn to drive for anyway, she said. Don't you go around Chicago in taxi cabs and trolleys? I couldn't explain it to Grandma.
I was getting too old to be a boy and driving meant you were a man. Something like that. I shrugged and she slid a billy busting breakfast in front of me. Mary Alice turned up looking like the ghost of herself. She was pale faced with bags under her eyes. Though glad to see daylight, she was worn to a frazzle. Anyhow, Grandma said, you don't have time for driving lessons. I want you two to poke around in the attic. I can't get up there anymore. You have to climb up through a trap door in the closet. What are we looking for? Oh, I don't know. Any old rummage for the church sale. So Grandma, who didn't take part in community activities, wanted to go to the rummage sale. She ate with the fork in one hand, the knife in the other. Then she looked up like she was having one of her sudden thoughts. Tell you what, find that old stovepipe hat up there. It belonged to a preacher who knew my mom, Pa. He was visiting one time trying to convert them, and he dropped dead on the parlor rug. They kept a stovepipe hat on their hat rack ever after to remember him by. I stuck it up there. Get it down. I saw a picture in the paper of John D. Rockefeller in a hat like that. They might be coming back in style. I doubted the last part, but Mary Alice and I dragged a ladder upstairs. Grandma followed as far as the second floor to show us where the trap door was. We were disappearing up into the attic when below us she said, Watch yourselves. I might have bats in the belfry. We weren't familiar with attics, but this one wasn't too crowded. Grandma used up more than she saved. There were some three-legged chairs and a dress dummy half her size and some coal oil lamps from olden times. Mary Alice dodged cobwebs and tried not to brush against anything. I hate it up here, she said. But then we started going through a couple of old steamer trunks. I pulled a big furry buffalo robe out of mine. What about this? Mary Alice shrank. Don't touch it. It's awful. It's got living things in it. She was right. Things with wings. I put it aside. Then I came to some baby clothes. Maybe dad's. Nothing too likely, even for a rummage sale. <clears throat> Mary Alice's trunk was full of paper, yellowed farm journals and buttons on cardboard and a ton of dress patterns. Then she gasped. In her hand was an ancient valentine, a big heart surrounded by paper lace. The motto on it read, when Cupid sends his arrow home, I hope it misses you. It was signed with a question mark. But Chewy, who was it sent to? Mary Alice wondered. Grandma, I guess. She got valentines? Mary Alice and I stared at each other. Then she found another one, also ancient, but without the lace. When you're old and think you're sweet, take off your shoes and smell your feet. That sounds more like it, Mary Alice said. A voice of doom echoed up from the trap door. You find that stovepipe hat yet? It jumped and so did Mary Alice. The lid on her trunk dropped down on her head. Grandma was standing right under the trap door, listening to us and waiting for the stovepipe hat. I really, really hate this attic, Mary Alice said, whispering. The hat was in my trunk. I handed it down to Grandma. It's getting too hot up here, Mary Alice said, and all these dress patterns are from before the war. But out of the bottom of her trunk, she pulled up an old quilt. It was so worn you could see through it. Its pattern was fancy but faded. How about this, she said to me. She was looking around the hem to see if the quilt maker had stitched in her initials, but the edges were all fraying away. What is it? said the trap door. An old quilt, we both yelled down. I forgot about that, Grandma hollered back. My Aunt Josie Small, piece that quilt, drop it down. I did, and Grandma said, keep at it. We listened to her trudge away. Other trunks were tucked away under the eaves, so it took us all morning to go through everything. But we didn't find anything else any sane person would want in a thousand years. So they took a hat and a quilt. We'll have to see what Grandma ends up doing with that.